please join me in welcoming the Honorable Anthony J. Blinken, our 71st U.S. Secretary of State. Good morning, everyone. Edith, um, thank you for not just the overly kind introduction, but thank you for your incredibly powerful, sustained, consistent voice, a voice that resonates in this room, a voice that's resonated in the halls of Congress, a voice that resonates in this department. To you, uh, to Ambassador Bushnell, John, to you as well, um, we're so grateful for your presence here today. It speaks volumes of your enduring dedication to some of the people in this room, to many who are not, but also to our institution, because so much of this is also about making our institution better, particularly when it comes to looking out for its people. Every August 7th, for a quarter century now, our State Department community here in Washington and in posts around the world has come together to observe the anniversary of the U.S. Embassy bombings in Nairobi and Dar al Salaam. On that day, as everyone in this room knows all too well, 224 colleagues, friends, community members, and loved ones were cruelly taken from us, from you. Thousands of others were injured, left, as you've heard, with wounds both seen and unseen, many that will last a lifetime. Our institution was scarred, and our country was newly awoken to the scourge of terror. It is an honor for me to be able to join you today in this solemn day of remembrance. And I'm honored to be here with our colleagues on this platform, but also uh, other colleagues in this room. You have with you today um, the then Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Susan Rice, my friend and colleague of so many years, who helped rally this institution in response to the attacks. You have with you today virtually the entire senior leadership of the State Department, with our Chief of Staff, Susie George, the Deputy Secretary of State for Management and Resources, Rich Verma, the Under Secretary of State for Management, John Bass, the Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Molly Fee. This, too, is some small evidence of our dedication to what this day means and what it needs to continue to mean going forward. And I just want to say a few words about that. But mostly, as I said a moment ago, I'm so grateful to Edith, to Prue, to John for their ongoing leadership, matched only uh, between what they did on that day, what they've been, done virtually on every day since, advocacy for their people, our people, in the aftermath. Ambassador Bushnell has written about how, following the bombings, she learned that she could not take away anyone's pain, their trauma, their anger. But, as she's put it, she could accompany them, stand with them, listen to them, support them. So that's the spirit in which I join you today, to remember the fallen, to celebrate their lives. On August 7th, the department lost Americans serving our country. And you, their families, most important, lost loved ones. We, uh, we throw numbers around a lot, but we know behind the numbers was a father, a son, a brother, a mother, a daughter, a sister. In this case, a big-hearted young Marine, just 21 years old, a former high school teacher turned consul general, passionate about helping people, his son, an aspiring foreign service officer who inherited his fa father's devotion to public service. A new grandmother, known as spirited and generous. A mother of three beautiful daughters. 
a naturalized U.S. citizen who served her adopted country in posts around the world, an American for whom Kenya had long been home before it became her final resting place, an epidemiologist and loving mom who came to Africa to save children in need, a career Army intelligence specialist and young dad to two daughters, a jazz musician from the Midwest, an Air Force senior master sergeant who never sought the limelight because, as one friend said, she never had to. A former Peace Corps volunteer who took extraordinary pride in serving all across Africa. For me, for the rest of the department, for the country, we will never really know their stories as so many in this room did, you, their loved ones. But I know that they chose to dedicate themselves to public service, that they died trying to make American and African lives better. And mostly, mostly, their lives made a difference. One of the things I found um, in my own experience is that some of us in this life are somehow called upon to make a lifetime's worth of difference in a period that is shorter than what we normally consider a full life. Your loved ones did exactly that. In some cases, in a very small period of time, they made a lifetime's worth of difference. And that's an incredibly powerful, beautiful legacy to carry forward. When I'm asked about working here, working in public service, um, I often say the thing that motivates me the most is to go to work every single day with, literally or figuratively, the American flag behind my back. I know that for your loved ones, they felt that same inspiration, that same motivation. We also know that that flag, as we were discussing before we came out here, also makes us a target. And we have to factor that in and account for that in everything that we do. And I'll say a few more words about that in a moment. But today we also remember the hundreds of others who were killed on that day. The 34 Kenyans and 10 Tanzanians who were working for our embassies. Our Foreign Service Nationals are the lifeblood of every single mission we have anywhere in the world. Two-thirds of this institution is comprised of locally engaged staff. We couldn't do our work without their partnership, without their friendship, and we saw that on display in Kenya and Tanzania 25 years ago. And then, as you've heard, so many others who were just going about their lives, going to work, shopping, traveling, all of them in the wrong place at the wrong time. I'm grateful, ambassadors, to both of you, Ambassador Mayo, Ambassador Kanza, for joining us today, for joining us in keeping this memory as a powerful source of inspiration for what we're doing today and what we'll be doing in the days ahead. And I thank you. Finally, today, we pay tribute to the extraordinary courage, indeed the heroism, of so many. You've heard it referred to already. People who jumped into the breach, who staunched wounds, who pulled survivors from the rubble, who turned cars into ambulances and homes into hospitals, who got the injured out and got help in, who set up temporary embassies, not only to coordinate response efforts, but also to ensure that our posts could continue their vital daily work. Americans, Africans, who ensured that the spirit of Harambe all pulled together prevailed. As one U.S. aid worker based in Nairobi at the time of the bombing said, we were an embassy family, not a collection of acronyms. And that was something also 
that our entire country, and in fact the entire world, saw on August 7th. U.S. Embassy staff, the locally employed staff, their families, they all shoulder significant risks and hardships, professional and personal, to carry out the work of diplomacy. So we owe them, I owe them, this entire team owes them to look out for them every single day. We owe them to spare no effort to ensure their safety and their well-being. But I have to tell you, it's in so many ways thanks to you, thanks to the families of those who are lost, thanks to my colleagues on this platform who day in, day out, these past 25 years, have done so much to make sure that we are living up, or at least trying to live up effectively, to that responsibility. Making sure that we heard, year in, year out, of that ongoing responsibility. Taking that message to Congress. Taking that message to your fellow citizens. Um, for all of us, I simply want to say thank you because your own efforts, your own courage, your own commitment has done so much to make this institution better than it was in looking out for its people. That's a job that's not yet complete. We have a lot of work still to do. But after the bombings, we work with Congress to invest almost one and a half billion dollars every year to build more secure embassy facilities. I've had the privilege in this job traveling around to see a lot of those facilities. And I know that they wouldn't be there were it not for your voices, your advocacy, your tireless commitment. We also partnered with Congress on legislation that required new protections like the 100-foot setbacks, high perimeter walls, access control for visitors. We continue to take steps to work to keep our personnel safe today while ensuring that they can engage with local communities and carry out their missions. You all know better than just about anyone how challenging getting that balance right is. We send people around the world so that they can engage, so that they can connect, so that they can represent us. Making sure that they're able to do that while doing everything possible to ensure that they do so in safety and security is the work we bring every single day. Um, I'm looking at, in particular, at Deputy Secretary Verma and Under Secretary Bass. I know how they and their teams every single day are taking to this responsibility. And I think I speak for them and everyone else here in saying that as we're doing that, somewhere your voices, your experiences, your stories are resonating in our heads and also in our hearts. There's another thing that's so important to me, and you've heard it referred to. We've also worked to improve our support for our team during times of crisis. 30 years ago, uh, mental health support at a post was extremely limited, if it existed at all. Today, we've got a core of psychiatrists that provide crisis response, one-on-one -on -one counseling, and other direct services. Our care coordination team assists in case of physical health in incidents, including by helping to secure workers' compensation, workers' benefits. The Office of Casualty Assistance acts as a single point of contact for bereaved families and those who've experienced critical incidents like a terrorist attack. One of the messages I've tried to share with everyone in this department, Under Secretary Bass, in particular as well, is that especially when it comes to mental health challenges, there is not, there cannot be, there must not be any stigma attached to raising your hand and saying, I need some help, I need some support. I want to make sure that everyone in this institution understands that, knows that, and as necessary, acts on that. Sometimes the most powerful way to connect with people on that proposition is to share stories, 
to let them in on your own experience. It's incredibly powerful, especially as colleagues see someone who they couldn't imagine has a, uh, a care in the world when they learn the story, what's affected them, how their lives have been affected. It helps give people uh, the courage themselves to come forward to look for assistance. And so I'm grateful to so many of you who in different ways have shared your own trauma, shared the difficulties that you've had. And we know that sometimes they can be immediate, sometimes it manifests a week later, a month later, five years later, ten years later. We don't know. But I do know that our ability to be there for people who are experiencing this and the willingness of so many to share their experiences makes a profound difference. Finally, and I benefit from this every day, we've significantly increased both our staffing and the authorities and resources for diplomatic security. Our colleagues who every day are putting their well-being and their lives on the line to look out for the rest of us. We've also grown our partnerships in Kenya, in Tanzania, across the region to make sure that they're stronger than ever. Maybe that's the most powerful possible repudiation of the violence and hate that was on display that day. After the bombing, most of our embassy staff returned to work as soon as they could. That's what we do. 79 people, 71 in Nairobi, eight of them Dar es Salaam, still work at those embassies today, 25 years later. This, too, is an incredibly powerful statement about a shared commitment, a shared vision, a shared value for a world that's a little bit more free, a little bit more open, a little bit more prosperous, a little bit more secure. I can't think of a better way to honor the scars, the sacrifices of that day than to carry forward the work that those we lost were engaged in, the work of diplomacy, the work of the United States, the work of connecting our country with other countries. What I'd like to do now is just ask everyone to join me in observing a moment of silence. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your presence here today. Thanking, thank you for allowing us to join you in commemorating this day. It's the highest of honors. It's also the highest of inspirations to make sure that we do everything we can to live up to the responsibility that is the legacy of your loved ones. Thank you.